So why don't we start the shoulder today? Uh, so we're going to talk. We're going to start uh, talking a little bit about uh, some of the anatomy and the chromium, then talk about the rotator cuff and instability bones and some soft tissue considerations. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about technical aspects for doing the MR scanning, and then we'll go into these other topics. So typically on high field, our, our current protocol, and uh, we have a bunch of musculoskeletal radiologists, and none of us are completely happy with it. And uh, so these are kind of what we've all kind of agreed to, but standardizing, I think, is very helpful. So... Uh, <clears throat> We do oblique image, oblique coronal imaging along the course of the supraspinatus tendon. And when you position the patients, we like the humerus externally rotated if possible, but a lot of patients who have shoulder pathology or are uncomfortable in that position can't stay still. And therefore, uh, often they have to be imaged in internal rotation to get any images at all. But external rotation allows us to better visualize the along here the biceps tendon, as well as the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. And it stretches out the subscap as well. <laughs> and we like to do now coronal imaging with a T2-weighted sequence and a proton density fat suppressed sequence, and then an uh, axial T1, an axial PD fat set, and then an oblique sagittal T2. And I want you to notice that we do not fat set uh, the, the T2 images. And we had a, a lecture at Kur Carl and Joe this uh, morning, and uh, Scotty there uh, also uh, uh, believes that uh, too many fat suppressed images decrease our ability to, to really see the anatomy and evaluate uh, structures within the shoulder. So uh, I think one of the main uh, uh, problems that I see from outside scans is that they do too much fat suppression, and fat is a great contrast agent in the musculoskeletal system, so you really shouldn't saturate it out too often. So this is typically what we see. In the old days, we also did T1 weighting, uh, where we can see a little bit of the tendinosis pattern, but we think that we can see that very well with the PD fat sets. Uh, the T2 images allow us a little bit more specificity when we try to grade whether there's a tear versus severe tendinosis. The tendinosis is fairly dark on T2, it's bright on the PD fat set, but fluid is very bright on the T2, so it really helps with specificity. And we still have good fat signal on the T2-weighted images. Uh, these are fat spinecho T2. In the old days when we did standard T2, which I don't think anybody does anymore because it's a very long sequence, uh, fat was actually suppressed on a true, truly uh, T2-weighted image, but we're talking about fat spinecho T2. In the axial plane, we've looked at a lot of different sequences. Uh, and now, there are a lot of people who like T2 fat suppressed sequences where you have a longer TE. The problem with that is you lose a lot of signal to noise and you get much greener images, though the contrast is uh, maybe a little bit better when you're looking at fluid in the joint if it's a T2 fat suppressed image. But overall, the spatial resolution due to the poor signal to noise is substantially degraded. A lot of smaller lesions sometimes can be missed. Even though you may have a little better contrast for fluid, the signal to noise losses are, are an issue. So we prefer the PD fat set, fat suppressed images, and the standard T2 uh, for the T2 component. Uh, so here is a 25-year-old uh, Major League Baseball player he had a prior labral repair, and I just want to point out here, we can see a little tiny uh, uh, density here on the CT scan in the region of the articular cartilage up here. And notice uh, when it, you have metal, you get a much bigger blooming artifact on the MR examination. Uh, but that's what a little bit of, of metal can do, depending upon the composition of the metal as far as artifact. And we'll talk. So when we know there's our metal, we, we like to do some metal uh, suppression techniques. But the metal suppression techniques on MR are still far from ideal, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes CT can be helpful. If you have a large amount of metal, even, even CT has difficulties. And some metals are less uh, worrisome than others on MR. Low field protocol, we use a little bit different technique uh, because the PD fat sets are not very robust uh, at low field imaging because uh, at lower fields, when we talk about the physics section, we'll talk about how you can't separate the fat and water peaks very well at, at low field. And therefore, if you have a fat suppressed sequence, uh, 
uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, you get a lot of loss of signal to noise if you try it at low field versus high field. So here we do a T1 and T2 and a stir coronal T1 axial. And the stir axials are not very good because of poor spatial resolution for the, for the labrum. So I like to use a gradient echo technique here, uh, which we'll look at. And then again, we use the oblique sagittal T2 weighted images, which are perpendicular to the coronal uh, sequences. When we have an arthrogram, we make some mild changes. One, I, if you do arthrography, we strongly recommend that you not do it at low field, that if you're going to do arthrogram, it really should be done on a high field scanner. And here uh, uh, on the coronal images, we re replace the T2 with the T1 fat set. And then we also do a oblique coronal uh, T2 without fat set. I mean, we, we add a T1 fat set. And then we do the other techniques just like we did before. And then we do a T1 fat set in the axial plane and a sagittal T2, also like we did before without fat suppression. And uh, <clears throat> the value of arthrography is uh, debated very much. And anybody can find an article in the literature that supports their views pretty much. This is one that shows that 3T does, is not, does not improve arthrography. Uh, generally, I find is uh, people are more sophisticated with MR imaging. The value of 3T over 1.5T is kind of evaporated. In the early days of 3T, the 1.5 scanners that they compared it to were all old scanners with old techniques. Now with modern techniques, in general, in the musculoskeletal system, uh, if you use a modern day scanner with the, that are similar, have similar pulse sequences and so forth, I find that practically there's very little improvement of 3T over 1.5T. Uh, and that's what more of the recent papers have shown that have looked at it a little bit more sophisticated. I think there's a big difference between 1.5 and sub one Tesla scanners. Uh, I think sub one Tesla, especially down around 0.3 Tesla, where we have some open scanners, is a substantial decrement in image quality. But uh, quite frankly, I, I don't really believe there's much of a difference between 1.5 and 3T. I haven't had any personal experience with 7T, uh, but the people I've talked to there, there are other issues uh, going to 7T and doing generalized musculoskeletal imaging. So here's a young athlete with uh, shoulder pain, uh, evaluate for cuffed hair. Uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? Okay, T2, T1 fat set, and T2 fat set. Um, this first medical looks good, So what the technique is, first we can see this is a T1 fat set. Fluid is bright, so this is an arthrogram, right? Okay, right. So the question then is, what is this high signal intensity here? And you can, here you can see a little bit of linear, streaky, low signal intensity on the PD fat set within the supraspinatus tendon. When they inject that, right? Yeah. So, uh, one one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I'm not a big fan of arthrography is one I don't really think it helps most of the time. Though there occasionally it can be helpful with labral tears, and I'll show some examples where we can see labral tears better. But we did a study and we found that there was only about a one percent change in the diagnosis uh, when we compared uh, standard MR imaging to arthrography when we did kind of a double sequence where we did both in patients. So uh, sometimes you can see things better. Sometimes it makes for better images for lectures. But the overall diagnosis we found was almost never changed between standard MR imaging and arthrography. Uh, and then you can get injections in places you don't want. Uh, and we almost always with an anterior approach, we'll get contrast injected into the, that leaks into the subscapularis tendon. Uh, and if you have a strain of the subscapularis tendon, then you're kind of screwed because it's it's going to look like it on, uh, on most sequences. And uh, and there have been rare situations where you can get uh, complications of the arthrographic injections. And then patients really don't like having needles stuck in them unless they need to. But there are a lot of people who disagree. Uh, for those of you who are at the lecture this morning, uh, you know, Scotty is a much bigger believer in arthrography than I am, so he does a lot more arthrography. Uh, well, lawyers are going to discourage it. Yeah. 
Well, why, why would lawyers discourage it, John? Well, they're starting to sue and advertise on TV. Well, um, that's for IV contrast. I don't think that's for, That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. For orthographic contrast. Actually, there was, a, there was a paper that was just published. And why they did this, I don't know. But they, they looked at MR scans of and people who have orthographic injections with gadolinium. They uh, evaluated the brains to see if there was any detectable gadolinium in the brain. And it turns out there was none, which since you only use a couple of drops of gadolinium and you dilute it 30 uh, or 200 to 1, the amount of gadolinium you inject in a joint is extremely low and is very slowly absorbed by the body. You really wouldn't expect any, but those studies confirm that there is no detectable uh, gadolinium in the brain if it's an orthographic injection as opposed to an IV injection. Uh, now this just shows that, that, that there's an orthographic injection uh, in the in the anterior approach. And another thing that can happen is uh, the sub the subacromial subdeltoid bursa uh, in most patients uh, communicates with the subcoracoid bursa, and you'll often puncture the 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 sheet that goes down to the subcoracoid bursa, and I'll show more about this later, uh, when you do the orthographic injection. So it's not uncommon to actually get contrasts extending into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa just from the injection. Here we can actually see, here's the anterior injection going through the subscapularis, the typical approach that most people around here uses. And you can see you go right through the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and you can get contrast uh, injected into that bursa uh, when you do the injection. And that can also lead to uh, a false positive result uh, with an arthrography. This is obviously a CT arthrogram, uh, but you can see the same thing with MR. So just be careful that you can get leakage into the bursa even if you don't have a tear. So that's... Uh, that, uh, John, yep. let's suppose you operate on a, a case like that. Um, uh, uh, what do you think the lawyers will do to you? Well, then, then I think if somebody will, uh, will sue you for a misdiagnosis, they, they could do that. Yep. Uh, they, 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 they come up with all kinds of um, reasons to sue. Attorneys are well. clever people. Yep. Uh, th this is something else I wanted to point out, which is not a problem anymore, but it was at one time. In the early days of doing MR, the joint, people would use large field of views like you used a brain, because a lot of the early people who did it were neuroradiologists, like I was at that particular time. And we kind of take neuro, the MR protocols that were developed for the brain and start using them in the joints. And uh, this is just a, using kind of a brain protocol with a 24 centimeter field of view compared to a 12 centimeter field of view. This, this is some early scans. And if you notice that using a too large of a field of view, you really have poor spatial resolution. And there was an actual two papers that were published, I think it was 88 or 89 at the same time. Both of them looked at MR of the shoulder. One came up where uh, the accuracy of MR for evaluating uh, supraspinatus tendon tears was greater than 90%. The other one said that, that the accuracy of MR was no better than flipping a coin. And they were used 1.5 Tesla scanners. They used the same techniques. But if you look at it, and so one said that MR was not valuable in the shoulder and it shouldn't be used. The other one said it was very valuable and should replace arthrography, which was the standard at that time. And if you look at the difference, one scanned the shoulder at a 24 centimeter field of view and the other at a 12 centimeter field of view. So you can probably guess which one had good results and which one did not have good results. And so the, the, uh, the spatial resolution is really important. So we typically like to scan the shoulders at 12 field of view. And even on low field scanners where you're a little pressed with signal to noise, uh, you should never use more than a 15 centimeter field of view uh, in this day and age, I don't believe. Uh, when you scan the, the shoulder. There's still a lot of people who use 18 and 20 centimeter fields of view at low field, and I think those scans are really not diagnostic. Uh, okay, so that's a little bit. Does anybody have any questions concerning the techniques of evaluating the shoulder with MR? Do we ever use the Aber view? 
Oh, oh good. I'll bring up the Aver view in a minute, but that's a, certainly a good question. The Aver view was actually developed by a former fellow of mine. Uh, his name is Philip Turner. And the concept behind it was that if you put the, the arm uh, up and uh, kind of really, uh, uh, externally rotate it, that you actually pull traction on the anterior inferior labrum, will separate it, and it'll increase the sensitivity for detecting anterior labral tears. That was the first concept about it. And several people have done studies. Uh, we did one to show that there was about a 2% increased detection rate with the Aver view versus the standard view, which was uh, much lower than what we had anticipated. So typically what we do, we do not use the Aver view except in young athletes. And we actually use the Aver view in young athletes more to evaluate the posterior superior part of the shoulder than the anterior inferior part of the shoulder. But I'll show you examples of Aver views and where they can be helpful uh, when we in, in areas of pathology. So the bottom line is, if we have young athletes, we still occasionally use it. And it's a pain to use. Uh, you have to, what you have to do. You typically you do it with uh, arthrography. You put the you put in the injection. Uh, you do the, the scan with the patients in regular position, and then you take them out. You reposition the shoulder. Uh, you have to re uh, uh, determine locations and everything, and and then you scan them uh, in the Aber position. So it really is two separate scans when you do that. That kind of doubles the length of the time of the scanner. So uh, I found that for people over the age of 35, it really doesn't have any value. So I don't use it there. Uh, for young athletes, we will selectively use it uh, for them, if, especially if they're overhead throwing athletes. Got it. So uh, so here we go. This is the, the sagittal plane, the oblique sagittal plane. Here we can see the CC ligaments here. You can see the chromium process with the spine posteriorly here. Uh, if we go out a little further, we can see the corkwood process, which comes off the, the anterior aspect of the scapula here, and the chromium process, which comes off the spine uh, back here, and here's the AC joint, and here's the, uh, uh, okay, that's just it. and then we can see the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis tendons, this is a nice view also for the one here, the biceps tendon. This is obviously an arthrographic technique uh, where we can see that nice. And you can see that arthrography often does, if you don't have an effusion in the joint, allow you to visualize the one here, the biceps tendon kind of nicely. Um, most people who have significant pathology in the joint space, however, will have an effusion. Uh, so, uh, and then we can see the shape of the chromium uh, and and we'll talk about how in the past we divided that into the different, several different categories uh, when we get to impingement. In the axial plane, uh, we can see the inferior labrum here, anterior, inferior, posterior, and inferior loop. And we go up to the CD articular cartilages, the anterior and posterior labrum, and uh, so that's just the anatomy. In the coronal plane, here we can see the, the uh, middle ligament and the ligament coming down through here. Superior inferior labrum and, and other structures. And uh, it, it, just like we talked about in the hip imaging, or we heard about the hip, both the hips and the shoulder imaging, uh, you can have a normal variant, uh, which is a defect in the center of the articular cartilage here. Uh, they have different names, and some people divide them into slightly different locations and so forth, but just remember that you can have a central defect there, uh, which can be a normal variant if it's right in the center of the brain. Okay. So uh, here's a 55-year-old uh, female who was uh, brought in to evaluate for a rotator cuff tear. And uh, what I'm pointing out here is uh, this particular structure here that has a little bit of uh, fluid around it. And here we're getting into a little small little section on some normal variants. Do you have any idea what this is, Sam? What the ALS poetry? Mm -hmm. Yes. There. Here we can see it right here as well. Yeah. Little so like, 
Browns. So this is the anomalous insertion. We go to the uh, pectoralis minor tendon. Generally, the pectoralis minor tendon go, goes to the uh, clavicle, but you can have a variant where it actually comes into the joint space like this and comes across. So. Okay, and then uh, here's the, the pectoralis minor muscle here, which you're all familiar with. And this just shows that variant coming across the top of the shoulder, uh, which is a, a variant. So these are two cases that have that particular anomalous insertion. And here we can see it going across the superior aspect of the, uh, the joint space and coming down through here to the pectoralis minor muscle. So just be aware that that's a, that's a fairly uncommon variant. And on the coronal images, it can look like a, a, a normal thickening of the, of, the, uh, of the tendon in this location. And so you have to really follow it out and back to, to actually see that it's an anomalous insertion. The main thing is just to, to understand what it is when you see it. So that's the anomalous insertion of the pec minor. And here are just some papers on it. Now this is the same thing. We don't need to see it again. Okay, uh, here's a 16-year-old male with pain. Uh, let me see, who do we have on the call today? Uh, Shiv, what do you think of this? All right, uh, so this looks like an axial image of the shoulder. Yeah, and... again, is going to be a... A variant anatomy. Variant anatomy. It's very hard. Uh, it's very hard right here because it's something that's missing. It's always hard to detect something that's not there. Huh. Okay. Let's see. Uh, the lab the anterior labrum looks like it's there. Uh, is the long head biceps tendon missing? Where is it? And if you look here, where's the intertuberous groove? Yeah, yeah, I don't really see it that well. Yeah. And if you look here, there's actually no biceps tendon. This is a congenital absence mm -hmm. of the biceps tendon, which is a very uncommon finding. And you know it's congenital because there's no intertuberous groove. If it had developed and then torn, it had an empty intertuberous groove, which we don't have here. So mm -hmm. that's another variation. Uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? A 23-year-old male pain after injury. Uh, so we have multiple axial views of the shoulder. And uh, looks like there might be a little bit of fluid at the... Right here? I guess, yeah, in the region of the infraspinatus, I think. Okay. Um, and... This, this is another... In general absence of the biceps tendon. This point oh, okay. how is it, how easy it is not to see it if it's not there. Well, then that's why it's important that you have a checklist you go through. Of course, you can take the whole checklist when you see cases on a uh, lecture like this. But it's important that you always look at the shoulder studies the same way every time so that you go through all the different structures you need to look at. And one of those is the biceps tendon. And this is another congenital absence. So, so let's talk uh, in some about the anatomy here. <clears throat> and the, uh, an important area of anatomy is the, uh, the anterior superior quadrant up here uh, where there's a lot of complex anatomy. It's, it's an area that because you have the core cord process sitting here, uh, you, uh, uh, you have a deficiency in the rotator cuff tendon. So you have supraspinatus here, subscap over here, and you have the rotator cuff interval in between there with a little some complex anatomy uh, that's that's quite important. Uh, so one of them is the long head of the biceps tendon, which comes up and attaches to the anchor superiorly. And if you notice that the shoulder joint, it's kind of uh, 40 degrees uh, of angulation in the in the axial plane, but also in the sagittal plane, it has about a 10 to 15 degrees angulation anteriorly. So this is really superiorly. This is inferiorly. Anteriorly is really down there. Posteriorly is really up here, which is slightly at a, at a rotation with respect to the axes of the rest of the body. 
And that can occasionally lead to difficulties when you do study correlating arthrographic find, uh, arthroscopy findings with MR findings if you don't make sure you're using the same coordinate system. Uh, um, so, uh, and as Scotty talked a little bit about in the lecture that a lot of us attended this morning, here's a, the insertion of the bicep superiorly here, just superior to the superior labrum. Sometimes it's mechanically connected to the superior labrum and sometimes not. Just in front of that is the superior glenohumeral ligament, which comes underneath it and back up. And this is called the sling. This helps hold the biceps in a normal position because uh, otherwise what it likes to do is sublux anteriorly and inferiorly, uh, which we'll see as a pathologic lesion, which is a common cause of anterior shoulder pain. Uh, and uh, looking at it, uh, uh, and cross-section the biceps here, but the, the superior glenohumeral ligament comes from anteriorly, just a little bit below the biceps anchor, underneath the biceps and back up again, and, it's, and it holds the biceps up. And we will talk about pathology in that area when we get to the biceps tendon, which will be another lecture. Now, uh, when we give a report, there are about seven things that Richard Hawkins, who was a well-known shoulder surgeon, uh, and uh, at this, when, when he issued this, he was in Vail, Colorado at the Stedman Hawkins Clinic there, uh, <clears throat> that there are seven things he wants to see in the radiologist's report. He wants the size of the rotator cuff tear, the quality of the surrounding tissues, the location of the tear, whether or not there's significant fatty infiltration within the muscles of the rotator cuff, is there elevation of the humeral head? What is the, the morphology of the chromium process and the status of the biceps tendon? So just, uh, we'll come back to these later, uh, but these should be really uh, always in your report, especially if there's any pathology of the rotator cuff. And usually the supraspinatus tendon is not normal. So it's important that, that all of these issues be addressed in, in your reports. So let's talk about some of the size and location of rotator cuff tears. Uh, when we look at techniques to look at it, uh, there are some, some issues that have to do with the techniques. Now, in the past, we typically did a T1, a T2, and a PD fat set. We no longer do the T1 anymore because we don't have great contrast here. And areas where we do have contrast on the T1 is typically due to the fat, and we can see that on the T2. So we've uh, trimmed our protocols just to these two, as you know. Now, with PD fat set, you can certainly see the area of pathology, but notice the edges of the tear are often poorly visualized on PD fat set, and studies that we and others have published show that if you try to do measurements on the PD fat set, those measurements are not very accurate because it's very hard to determine the margins of the tear. And it's also hard to do those kind of studies because we try to use arthroscopy is the gold standard, but once you put fluid in and you put it in the arthroscope, you distort all of the anatomy. So the measurements arthroscopically really are, are really artificial measurements because you deform all of the tissues by having the scope in there. But anyway, what we did find though, on the T2, you get much better delineations of the margins of the tear. So we do all the measurements on the T2 non-fat suppressed images, and they tended to correlate better with the estimates at arthroscopy. And that's really what we want to do, even though arthroscopy may not be accurate for determining the size of the tear uh, in the native state, it's really correlation with arthroscopy, which is important for the surgeon. And we found uh, we had much better correlation with the T2 images. Yes, John? One thing about arthroscopy is you have the arm on, on, on stress of 10, 10 pounds, and the position is quite different from that of uh, of the MRI positioning, right. so it's apples and oranges. Yep, right. Okay, and then uh, looking at the supraspinatus tendon here, this is an arthrogram injection, and there we can see the uh, the the tear in, in this location, uh, <clears throat> and this shows that we can actually see the tear on the T two weighted image. But the T2-weighted image is really much less sensitive than the PD fat set, or in this case, if you do arthrography, even the T1, uh, because we don't have as good a contrast uh, for subtle tears. So T2 is great for the size of the defect, uh, but for tears where you don't have fluid filling it, uh, the T2 is, is less sensitive. Uh, we don't need 
through this stuff. Uh, and this just shows another example where we can delineate the margins of the tear somewhat better on the regular T2. Uh, often the edges of the tear are obscured due to severe uh, 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 tendinosis in the tendon uh, on the uh, PD fat set images. Now, so the next thing then, size of the tear, we like to measure them, and that's why we do T2 non fat suppressed images in the sagittal and the coronal plane. So we can get sagittal and coronal measurements of the size of the tear, one of the issues. And then the, uh, the, the status of the surrounding tissue. So here we have a, this is uh, again with contrast, T1 fat suppressed coronal. PD fat set in T2. And what we can see here, again, the T2 shows us the size of the tear very well, but it, it really the PD fat set uh, tells us uh, the status of the, of the adjacent tissue. With a lot of increased signal intensity on the PD fat set here, this indicates that you have severe tendinosis, so it'll be very friable tissue, and tissue that has high signal like this doesn't hold sutures very well. So uh, this lets a surgeon know that uh, putting sutures just in this area may be insufficient to have a good result, and they may have to make sure that they, they garner more tissue uh, when, they, when they do the surgery. T2 is not very good at that because even uh, tendinotic tissue can be low in signal intensity on the T2. If you give contrast, T1 can be helpful, uh, but uh, generally I prefer not to give do the arthrogram. So it's really the PD fat set image that allows us to evaluate the quality of the tissue and the T2 that gives us the, the size of the defect. Sorry, Dr. Cruz. If T2 is not reliable for tendinosis, then how do we solve the problem of magic angle for those with T2? Uh, well, uh, we can talk about magic angle. Uh, uh, now, we'll, talk, we'll go to the physics section when we get there, what magic angle is and why it occurs. Uh, at, the, at the angle. The main magnetic field on a high field scanner is up and down. So when you have tissues that have longitudinal type structure, mechanical structure like a tendon, and if that tendon is at around 55 degree angle with, her, with respect to the main magnetic field, what it does is the interaction between the magnetic field and the water molecule uh, changes the water's uh, uh, timing parameters uh, uh, such that you get increased signal intensity on short TE images like we see here. Uh, most of the time, it's not really a problem because this is a typical magic angle artifact where it kind of fades in and out. It's right at the 55 degree angle, and we can see that the margins and a lot of the structures are still intact in it. If you call it mild tendinosis, that's not really a big deal, but this is typical magic angle artifact. When you give the T2 weighted image, this will go away, and uh, that also helps support that it's magic angle artifact. But again, it could be tendinosis, but it, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to change your, your treatment by this. So if you call this mild tendinosis, that's really not going to change the management of the patient. But when it's just located in this uh, location right here and you don't have a tear next to it, then uh, we generally presume that this is magic angle artifact. And on the T2, we can see that that artifact goes away. And we'll explain why T2 doesn't show it when we get to the physics section. Let's see, who did the last one? Was it Thomas or Shiv? Uh, I think I did the last one. Okay. okay. Yeah, left shoulder pain, we have T1 fat cells and T2 fat cells, coronal wheels, and there is. Increasing on the attachment of the sports matas to the T1 fat. So, what would you call this? So, it looks like a full, full, looks like a full thickness here? Yeah, but the thing is that there is no retraction. Okay, a so couple of things. Good, you don't see retraction. If you also look, this is a T1 fat set. The fluid, the, the contrast in the joint space is very bright here. The fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa is not as bright. Here, both fluids are equally bright, but it looks like you do have a tear in that, in that location. Now, if we go to the T2-weighted image in this same patient, what do you think? So, uh, okay, and this patient, this was called a tear. The patient went to surgery 
Today is no further. And you can also see that the longer regulator of the inferior program. Uh, could, could people silence? There's a lot of noise in the background. If you could put your, uh, oh, thank you, thank you. And then uh, what we see is a lot of irregularity here. So this is really tendinosis due to uh, outlet impingement from the acromion process rubbing on the, on the tendon. And uh, uh, this patient had no treatment at the time of surgery, and they just confirmed that, the, that it was intact. So the T2 can be helpful there as well, differentiating tendinosis. And again, part of the problem here is when you put contrast in the joint space, uh, if you have tendinotic tendon, it will absorb the contrast and change the enhancement characteristics, which can make a tendinosis look more severe than it would if you didn't have gadolinium in the joint space. In my experience over time, the number one complaint that I've heard from orthopedic surgeons who have called me to complain about our radiologist is that the false positive rate uh, for MR was too high in the shoulder. So just uh, remember that. Why would T2 fat sat? There's no similar. fat sat. No, it, it, you're... Well, I don't do two, 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 two fat sets. Right, I know we don't do. You said that, but you're, the next thing that you brought up with the box with the. It doesn't matter. Uh huh. Yeah, here you said PD and T two FS images. Yeah. Um, I can see why PD would cause that. Why would T two fat set cause that? Uh, I guess because when you when you actually fat set, yeah. uh, you can you can change the contrast. Uh, but we don't do T2 fat set images anymore, yeah, so it's not, not really an issue. Okay. Uh, so what do you think of this case? So. Well, if we only had the T1 and PDFS, we would think that there was a partial um, articular side tear. But okay. the T2 shows that it's, that it's not fluid. Well, yeah, but right. Good. Okay. <clears throat> And this is kind of on the other side. Notice that we don't really see the inferior surface here. And the inferior surface you really should be able to see uh, on, the, on these images. should be a nice little black line there. Even if you had tendinosis, you can usually see that line. And here we just see a little bit of signal change within the tendon in that location. And at arthroscopy, this was a partial tear. So I just want to point out that there are good things and bad things about T2 that you need to know about. T2 is insensitive for evaluating partial tears. So when you actually see that the fluid goes all the way through here, in this case contrast, uh, without any surface of the tendon, that's a pretty reliable sign that you're dealing with a partial tear. It would be nice to be able to window that. But also, it's uh, that's also orthographic um, yeah. fluid. So I guess that would also make it a bit, a bit lower on T2, wouldn't it? That's right. Exactly. Okay. That's right. Because the uh, the gadolinium uh, uh, decreases the uh, the T two time and therefore makes the fluid darker on T two. Okay, uh, Shiv, what do you think of this case? Oops, Shiv, did you did you, do you want to turn your mic on? Nope, we lost Shiv. <clears throat> Shiv, your mic's turned off. Okay, I'll take it. So here's a case where we can see on the PD fat set, well, we see a little bit of increased signal intensity uh, within the tendon here. We don't really see a good inferior surface, but it looks like tendinosis. And then uh, here is uh, where we put contrast in the joint space. We can actually see that that inferior surface is disrupted, and this was a small partial tear. Uh, these are really going to be treated the same. Uh, and maybe you could say there's a little partial tear because we don't see that a little black line inferior surface, but it is a little bit better visualized uh, when you do the arthrogram procedure than the non arthrogram procedure. It doesn't, but in this case, we said it didn't really change the management of the patient. Okay. Uh, and then uh, another thing to look for here is a. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Here's an arthrographic procedure, and here's the, the T2. Uh, with the T2, what we can see is that the fluid in the subacromial subdelta adversa is very bright on the T2, not so bright in the joint space because the joint space contains gadolinium, and the fluid here doesn't. We can see the partial intersubstance partial tear on the T2-weighted image, 
on the T1 fat side post, we can see the gadolinium. None of it goes into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa because we can see the inferior surface is still pretty much intact, and this is just an interstitial tear within the distal tendon. So that's just uh, what that can look like with contrast. The other thing is here, especially when you get put contrast in the joint space, the T2s aren't great for the labrum uh, because the, the contrast decreases, the gadolinium decreases the contrast of the fluid, and here we can see the slap tear uh, nicely. Why is the tear bright on the T1? Uh, this is gadolinium in it, and this is a T1 fat. No, no it's not that. But the, sorry, the, the rotator. The Here? Rotator. Yeah, why is that bright? Uh, there's, uh, it could be that a little bit of the gadolinium is, is kind of leaking into it. Uh, the other thing is you can have proteinaceous fluid uh, in, a, in a chronic tear like this where a lot of the water gets absorbed and you're left, left with more protein in it, and that can be bright on a T1-weighted image, especially with fat suppression. Okay, okay, and this is just an arthrographic study here uh, where we can see the arthrographic material, and there's the tendon that looks like intact and so forth, but then if we look at the T2 sequence, we can actually see that there's a near full thick dispersal side tear that does not go through the deep surface of the tendon, and therefore we don't see it on the arthrogram. So again, if you only had fat suppressed sequences, uh, a T1 after after give it, putting in the contrast, you wouldn't see this, but almost everybody. But I've seen some cases where they just put the contrast in and just do T1 fat set in three planes, and that's their study, and that's uh, that's really an unacceptable technique because here we can see it. But the one thing I want to point out is it's not uncommon to have large partial tears involving this, the supraspinatus insertion, which go to the bursal side surface, but go to, but don't go through the joint side. And when you arthroscope these patients, they can be normal at arthroscopy. So when you see that, I always like to put in the report the fact that it's a near full thickness bursal side tear, but it doesn't clearly uh, involve the, the joint side surface. So if they do arthroscopy and they don't see it, there's an explanation for what the fluid is. Because I've had a, a several orthopedic surgeons complain to me about radiologist reports being uh, false positive reports when they've done the arthroscopy, they haven't seen the tear, but this is the reason they didn't see the tear. And these are significant. These typically are unstable lesions and they can cause pain. So uh, that way everybody understands uh, what the images show. And here's just another non communicating tear here. Uh, you can see it's a bursal side tear, the joint side's still intact, and there, there's no contrast going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And that's what it looks like on the T2. And that's what it looks like on the on the sagittal. So if I just saw this. Uh, that... Arthroscopy is. I'm sorry to interrupt, John. Hmm. Arthroscopy is not 100% in terms of accuracy. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 you don't uh, see every corner and every nook and cranny uh, with the arthroscope. Sometimes you miss the boat. Okay. And uh, that, that could be a uh, uh, miss. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, it, it, uh, we don't know anything other than. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit there, John, but, but that's good. So, but, yeah. So, anyway, so when they're large like this, I would describe it so that it's understood that these could be near full thickness, but not necessarily all the way through especially if it doesn't communicate with arthrography. And there are articles in the literature, in the orthopedic literature, saying that greater than 50% thickness tears can be symptomatic, and that if you repair them arthroscopically, the patients do get better. So uh, so it's, it's good to describe these in a manner. So uh, if it doesn't go all the way through the surface and you don't see it arthroscopically, the surgeon still knows, understands what's there. What do they do when they cut open the shoulders? No, what they'll do is uh, they'll see the area where the tear is, and they'll they'll su do a suture anchor repair. And what I mean is, um, if it's if it's a bursal side non communicating, how would they treat that? The, the scope's not the same way they would if they did the, the the other kind. They would go through and and shove the the scope through this, and then put and in a suture the anchor through. right there, oh, and okay. and repair it. I see. Yeah. 
personally, from my own experience that we'll talk about later, uh, this is where most tears start on a supraspinatus tendon. And uh, my experience personally is that these can do very well without surgical repair. So I have I have full thickness tears in the anterior insertion of my supraspinatus tendons on both sides and was going to have surgery for each of them, decided not to. And uh, uh, exercise has been very beneficial to me. So uh, I think the pathophysiology of the pain in this situation is still a little bit unclear, but we'll talk more about that when we talk specifically about diagnosing uh, tears and the different kinds of tears. Right now, I'm just primarily letting, having you guys understand the difference in contrast between different techniques. And we'll talk about the pathophysiology of the disease uh, later. And here's someone who has uh, arthrogram injection, and they had a subchromial uh, injection, so they just had fluid in the subacromial space. They didn't get it in the joint space. And we see that occasionally. And here we can see that the contrast is in the wrong, wrong location. Uh, that can be one complication of arthrographic injections. And it was just uh, that this was actually injected into the supraspinatus tendon and the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the ABRA view, but again, here's one where you put contrast in, you do the regular scan, then you reposition the, the arm ab above the head and re image, usually with a little bit larger field of view. Uh, and then here we can see uh, on the regular study, we don't see an anterior labral tear. When you put it in the ABRA position, we can see the contrast extending through the anterior inferior labral tear. Uh, but again, of uh, 200 studies that we did, this is only one of a couple of, of uh, patients where we saw pathology on the ABRA view that we didn't see on the regular view. And it turned out we... Uh, about the same frequency would see pathology on the regular view that we didn't see on the Abe review. But in most people, it's still pretty small. Uh, <clears throat> but still, if it's a high-level athlete and a young person, then the Abe review is probably worthwhile doing. And here we can see. Uh, so let's see. Thomas, is it your turn? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I think it's Shiv. Shiv, are you with us? I'm back. Yep. Oh, you're back. Okay. Shiv, why don't you take this one? This was an arthrogram. Okay. So the question is whether there is an arthrogram. Um, <laughs> it was an arthrogram. It was an arthrogram. Okay. Well, I don't see very much contrast within the uh, glenohumeral joint. It's all it's sort of dark. Uh, what sort of C you don't see positive contrast, you see negative contrast. Negative contrast. So is this an air arthrogram or? Okay, so it could be this actually isn't an air arthrogram. Uh, it's an idea that there are actually uh, injection things that you could do for sh for joints that, which give low signal like this as well. I'm I'm trying to blank on uh, uh, viscous viscous type uh, injections that you can put in the joint space. They could look like this, but this was this was gadolinium that was injected in. So why would it look like this? Um, probably has to do with the TR and TE that we're using. Now this is standard T, T one weighted images. If we go to the uh, ah, too concentrated. images, this is what it looks like. And this is what happens. This is the kind of, this is what happens if you uh, don't uh, uh, dilute the kind dilute of, it. I think this right. was diluted one to one rather than two hundred to one. And this <laughs> kills all the signal, and that happens. What's happened here is some of it has been imbibed into the bone, and you actually see enhancement in the bone because it's a low concentration uh, in the bone there. Mm. Uh, so, so what do you do in a case like this? If you see this, if you happen to be seeing it on the, on the day the patient's done, which we don't do that much of it. Have the patient come back in yeah. forty-eight hours. No, have them come back in four to six hours. Four to six, okay. Call them and tell them to come back if they see this, and by the time they get back, it'll be the right concentration, and we'll do a good study. So you know, four to six hours, what happens in four to six hours? What, what happens is that the gadolinium is diluted. Yeah, you know, it gets happens. resorbed over time, and in four to six hours, this will be about the right concentration to get a good study. If it's resorbing that fast, okay, do we ask, why don't we see it? 
causes in the brain. That's because this was this yes. is a high concentration. It's usually not such a high concentration. It's usually not such a high concentration, but even then, even the amount that's here is such a low amount compared to giving IV that it's uh, unlikely to be seen in the brain. Uh, another technique that people have used in the past is that they'll give an IV injection, they'll exercise the patient and then uh, scan them. And there are a number of people who have liked this technique in the past. I haven't seen it recently. But what, it, what, what happens here is then, if you I give the IV injection, you exercise the person, then a certain amount of contrast will actually uh, move into the joint space and you'll get what's called an indirect arthrogram. The problem with this is it'll not only go in the glomerulonephrological joint space, but it'll also go in the subacromial deltoid joint space and every other joint space in the body. Uh, so you can't really tell whether you've got a communication or not. Here we can see that there is a tear. There's actually some proximal retraction here, so this is probably a full thickness tear with a little scar in situ here uh, in this particular pa patient. Um, most studies have shown that this is significantly inferior to uh, doing an arthrogram. Uh, a standard arthrogram. Uh, people would do this in the past because it could be done without a radiologist being there to do the injection. But I don't know of anyone who does this anymore, but you still may hear of indirect arthrography. It's just a and you typically do a pre-scan and then a post-scan, so the scanning takes twice as long as well. Uh, yeah, so this is just a CT arthrogram showing a tear with communication in the telephone subdeltoid joint space. Uh, one thing that if you look at, uh, uh, if you put gadolinium, a bar with gadolinium and a bar with iodine in a CT scanner, both will be dense. And we've had a few situations where people supposedly are allergic to iodinated contrast and we've injected full strength gadolinium into the joint space. They couldn't have an MR scan for various regions. And you can actually get a CT arthrogram, in this case showing that you've got uh, contrast going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and therefore they had a tear uh, uh, using gadolinium as a CT agent. Uh, I really don't recommend that. In this particular case, it's after you've had surgery of the shoulder, Having contrast going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa is nonspecific because most patients who have any kind of surgery in the shoulder will, will have leaky uh, capsule. Uh, so, but th this patient did turn out to have a uh, an acute tear of the supraspinatus tendon, and they actually went in in addition to the having the prosthesis there and did a repair of the rotator cuff. Okay. Yeah, you put it in full strength. Full. Uh, if, if you're using it for CT contrast. Hey, anybody have any questions about techniques for the shoulder? All right, then we'll go on to other, uh, we'll go on and talk about impingement uh, maybe tomorrow. Remember uh, uh, Tom and Shiv, tomorrow we're gonna have our interesting case conference. So if people could get me their interesting cases, uh, then you guys will present your cases to the other fellows into John and I tomorrow. And uh, so you, you'll present your case. One of the other fellows and your co-fellows will then uh, discuss it and then uh, we'll all discuss it together. Okay? Sounds good. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah.